Good morning, and thank you for joining me on the Path to Liberty. It's Wednesday, February 23rd, 2022. And on this episode, I've got an introduction to war powers under the Constitution. I'm briefly going to go over the power to declare war, the power to wage war, the fact that they're intentionally put in separate branches by the framers, and why. And then I've got some quick answers to some of the most, well, if I have time, to the most common questions that we get, kind of like an FAQ, like what qualifies as war? What about Thomas Jefferson? What's a constitutional foreign policy to the founders? Stuff like that that I think is very, very important and more important every single day. But first of all, before getting to that, my name is Michael Bolden. We broadcast live every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Except I took a day off on Monday, so I appreciate you guys giving me a little leeway there. But normally Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time from here in my home office and studio in downtown Los Angeles for the 10th Amendment Center. Our show homepage is everything you need to follow us. It's 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. It's all spelled out, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. There you're going to find all the archives of the show. We're almost on four years of episodes here. And the individual episodes, I publish a blog post for every single episode, one to two hours after the live show is done. And there you're going to find all the different platforms for each episode, all the video platforms, both live streaming and archive. Like we live stream on the mainstream ones, plus odyssey.com, which is the decentralized censorship resistant platform that I love. We also archive at places like MeWe and Brighteon and Rumble and Gab and everywhere possible. And we have the audio-only podcast edition, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Podbean, Apple, and the rest. And you can even find our membership program at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. That's the show homepage where you get all that stuff and more, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. And while we allow people another minute or so to take uh, to get uh, notifications on the live stream platforms. They don't always come in too quickly. I want to say hi to everyone out in the live chat. I appreciate you being here. My good buddy, Andrew Nappy, good to see you. Dixie Strong in Bama. Tim Martin, always great to see you in Arizona. Clay Kent as well. Robert Scott Bell, awesome. Go Michigan. Party on for Liberty. Uh, you, you guys should check out Robert Scott Bell's show six days a week, two hours a day. I do this three, sometimes three times a week, and I can't even imagine doing it as often as he does. Shane Lackey, Ed Hen, good to see you. Johnny Johnson, Tyler B., Murray Ray, Will Johnson. Haji, uh, De- uh, Senator DT, Erwin Havranek in Omaha, Merkin Muffley, I love that, Liberty Revolutionary, good to see you, buddy, um, Mike Takash, Vincent Q, thank you so much for your support, sir, appreciate you being here, Lawrence Smith, Davidson, and everyone else, thank you again for being here, I'll take a look in the chat a little bit later in the show, or today, or tomorrow, and see if I can answer some questions or get suggestions for future episodes, let's get right to this, and let's start out with the power to declare war. Now, if we're using modern terms, a lot of people think that the word declare means there has to be a written statement that declare to the founding generation, to the legal tradition that they drew upon was a specific written statement that says, I declare war on such and such. But this is nonsense. It really is a broader term under the Constitution, which means to change the status of things from peace to war. Here's Thomas Jefferson in his message to Congress on December 6th, 1805, and he put it this way, Congress alone is constitutionally invested with the power of changing our condition from peace to war. He's specifically referring to the power to declare war. Now, a declaration of war can come in many forms. It can be a statement that says, like the Pasha of Tripoli, for example, uh, says we are declaring war on this country or these people, whatever it may be. It could come in the form of an attack. It can come in the form of sometimes even a withdrawal from a specific treaty can be seen by the founding generation as an act of war. So there are very many things that can tell the world that you are going to be in a state of conflict with another country, uh, but they certainly, this decision, as Thomas Jefferson was so clear in making, is that Congress alone has that power under the Constitution. I did a much deeper dive episode into that. Very similar information that we have today, but not necessarily all the same. It's something that we can't repeat enough because as James Madison told us, war is the greatest threat to the public liberty because it leads to armies. And from armies, you get debts and taxes. And as Madison put it, armies and debts and taxes are the known instruments for putting the many under the domination of the few. That's his 420, 1795 political observations. I will cite that for something else a little bit later as well. Anyways, the power to declare war and introduction. I went through this 
in much more detail, also even covering some dictionary definitions. I went through some of the history on how uh, the version, what was seen as a declaration of war, how it used to be just a formal document, and then it moved uh transitioned into things like just an act of war. Attacking a ship would be seen as an act of war, and so therefore there was no longer a state of peace. Here's James Madison talking about the power to declare war. This is in his Helvidius letters, number one, or Helvidius essays. This is August 24th, 1793. He said, the executive has no right in any case, in any situation, to decide the question whether there is or is not cause for declaring war. It is not up to the executive to answer the question of, should we be in a state of war? Now, he may have an opinion, but it is not his decision to be made. Now, you might be asking in response to that, well, what if someone attacks the United States? What if a foreign nation uh, lobs a, a missile into the country? Whatever it may be. Isn't it too slow to wait on Congress than to declare war? Now, if we properly understand the term declare war, the phrase declare war under the Constitution is changing things from peace to war, then as soon as another nation attacks or as soon as a group attacks, whatever it may be, as soon as there's an outside attack, that status has already been changed. There is no question to be answered. Someone else has already done it. And therefore, it doesn't have to go to Congress to make the decision. It's just up to the executive branch to reply uh, or to respond, to handle it, however it may be. Here's Roger Sherman, for example, in the Philadelphia Convention. This is uh, August 17th, 1787. They were actually changing. They originally had put the power to make versus wage war, and they were concerned that that would be confusing, so they changed it to declare. Here's uh, Roger Sherman. He said, the executive should be able to repel and not to be able to commence war. That was his explanation of it. James Madison and Elbridge Jerry on that same day, they moved to insert the word declare, striking out make war. It left to the executive the power to repel sudden attacks. Now, even when we're talking about an attack, it doesn't just mean on interests, American interests or imminent threat of an attack. To people like James Madison, the father of the Constitution, the ability to repel an attack without a declaration of war from Congress really was even more limited than probably what I'm explaining. Maybe I'm not even doing a good job. Maybe I'm not being a solid constitutionalist because even there, they're saying it's only to repel a sudden attack. And I know people over the years have tried to argue and try to expand that, and they certainly have succeeded in it, but it's a much more restrictive view from Madison as well. Anyway, so that's the power to declare war, changing the status of things from peace to war. That brings me to the power to wage war. And here from a great paper by Raoul Berger, who no longer is with us, in 1972, and of course that was in the wake of the Vietnam War, he's talking about war making by the president. That's the name of the paper. And he says, on the specifics of the commander in chief function, Alexander Hamilton took pains to assure the people that the president's authority would be, quote, much inferior to that of the British king, the bulk of whose powers would, quote, appertain to the legislature. There was a lot of discussion about how this was, you know, is kind of modeled after the British, but then again, they learned from their experience and then they wanted to make it different. And here's Hamilton again. See if I can get this pulled up. And this is in Federalist number 69. Now, I, I like citing Hamilton on these types of things, especially because he's the biggest big government guy of the time. And if he's making this case and no one today is in line with even Hamilton, then you know how far things are off the rails. Here's Hamilton, Federalist 69. The pre president, this is basically what Berger was getting at in that paper. I will link to that one and everything else that I'm mentioning in the show notes, 10th Amendment Center dot com slash path to liberty. Here's Hamilton. The president is to be commander in chief of the army and navy of the United States. In this respect, his authority would be nominally the same with that of the king of Great Britain, but in substance, much inferior to it. It would amount to nothing more than the supreme command and direction of the military and naval forces as first general and admiral of the Confederacy, while that of the British king extends to the declaring, and he used all caps. That's just not a modern email forward thing. He used all caps. British king extends to the declaring of war and to the raising and regulating of fleets and armies. Those are powers that they 
kept with Congress, the legislative branch, the representatives of the people, rather than a single person. He said, all which, by the Constitution under consideration, would appertain to the legislature. Here again, Hamilton referring to the declaring of war, the determination the answer of the question, should things stay at a state of peace or move towards war, that is with the legislature. The King of Britain had the power to do both. And mind you, they had fought a long bloody war to get away from a lot of the stuff that the King of Britain <laughs> thrust upon the people. We'll put it that way. Back to Berger's great paper. I urge you to read this. He said, in the plan Hamilton submitted to the convention, Hamilton had his own... <laughs> You've heard me talk about things, if you listen to a lot of these episodes, you've heard me talk about things like the Virginia plan for the government. This was an early consolidated plan, the competing New Jersey plan on how things were going to be structured at the Philadelphia Convention. Hamilton had his own, and here's how Berger described it. He proposed that the executive, quote, should have the direction of war when authorized or begun. So the executive only steps in and is in charge of how things go once the status has been changed. The question has been answered. Now we are at war rather than at peace, implying that it was not for him to begin a war. That's, again, James uh, Alexander Hamilton. And if we Hamilton isn't enough, Madison Jefferson. Here's James Iredell, who was one of the first associate justices on the Supreme Court. I think number three, he was nominated by George Washington. And here he is in the North Carolina ratifying convention, July 28th, 1788. He said the king of Great, Great Britain, same type of message down in North Carolina as Hamilton had up in the Federalist Papers in New York. Now, it's possible that Iredell was reading those, but there wasn't a lot of distribution of the Federalist outside of New York State at that time. So it's possible, but they think they understood this. And we're talking about Iredell, a pretty great legal mind of the time, one of the top of the top. And this is how he's describing the king of Great Britain is not only the commander in chief of the land and naval forces, but has power in time of war to raise fleets and armies. He also has authority to declare war. The president has not the power of declaring war by his own authority, nor that of raising fleets and armies. It is not up to the president. And again, as I just mentioned a few minutes ago, if someone attacks, then no one in the government has made that choice in the United States. Someone from the outside has changed the status of things from peace to war. So he does not have the power of his own authority. Iredell continues, these powers are vested in other hands. So it could be Congress. It could be a hostile nation. The power of declaring war is expressly given to Congress. That is, to the two branches of the legislature. The Senate, composed of representatives of the state legislatures, <laughs> the good old days, right? And the House of Representatives, deputed by the people at large. It's supposed to be the representatives of the people and the representatives of the states making this big decision on whether the union of states will engage in a war. Now, the big question is, well, why the heck did they do this? And I've got a couple of quotes, Madison, Jay, back to James Wilson, I think. Madison, I think, has the best explanation here. And again, this is the political observations paper that I was cited a few minutes ago. I wasn't expecting to mention that one, but it's always important to note that Madison told us that armies and debts and taxes are the known instruments. A student of history, he saw that all throughout history, empires would put the many under the domination of the few through those three tools. And we have a trifecta, had had that trifecta for a long time. Here's what else he said. He said, the separation of the power of declaring war from that of conducting it is wisely contrived to exclude the danger of its being declared for the sake of its being conducted. Now, you might hear from time to time as there's wars or threats of wars, and there always are in our lifetime constantly, that, uh, you know, part of the problem is Congress trying to overstep into the executive and trying to conduct the war, or they can't direct how things are going. Oh, this is the commander in chief thing. But that wasn't the biggest concern to someone like James Madison. Now that, of course, there is an issue there as well. But the big concern to people like James Madison was to make sure that there wasn't a single person that could make this decision. Why? To exclude the danger of a war being declared for the sake of its being conducted. They knew that all through history, the executive branch, whatever form of government, was the most prone to war and the most likely to drag a country to it. Here's John Jay, first chief justice of the United States. They sure don't make them like they used to. Federalist paper number four. He said it is too true. And he's talking about a complete consolidation of power in a monarchy. 
but this is how they learn. They learn from their experience. It is too true, however disgraceful it may be to human nature, that nations in general will make war whenever they have a prospect of getting anything by it. Nay, absolute monarchs will often make war when their nations are to get nothing by it, but for the purposes and objects merely personal, such as thirst for military glory, revenge for personal affronts, ambition, or private compacts to aggrandize or support their particular families or partisans. So, when a single person can make that decision on whether or not there's going to be peace or war, and then on top of it be the person in charge of waging that war, deciding when it will continue or even end, John Jay knew, just like James Madison, that this was a very dangerous scenario, and people with that kind of power would often use it in really bad ways. And that's why James Wilson, in the Pennsylvania ratifying convention, December of 1787, arguing for the Constitution, he said, this system will not hurry us into war. It is calculated to guard against it. Whoa, things move fast these days. Well, that's... in. The founders intentionally wanted to slow the process down if there was going to be a decision. Now, if there is a, a sudden attack, of course, you can repel that. Some people would make the case that Madison was a bit of an outlier there and the executive had the power to repel an imminent or extreme threat, things like that. I think that gets into gray areas and we have to be a little concerned about those arguments. Anyways, Here's James Wilson again. It will slow us. It's not going to hurry us into war. We're guarding against it. Why? Because it will not be in the power of a single man or even a single body of men to involve us in such distress. For the important power of declaring war is vested in the legislature at large. And this one is one that I had not learned until last night. I literally was uh, putting together my notes for, for this episode today last night. I was on Twitter, as I always am as well. Follow me, at Michael Bolden. Pretty simple. And Dave Benner, a great writer for TAC and a number of other organizations for a long time, historian. He's writing a book on Thomas Paine, and he posted a quote, this one that I'm going to read here, and I had never seen it before, so I found it here at thomaspaine.org. The representative system does not put it in the power of an individual to declare war of his own will. It must be the act of the body of the representatives, for it is their constituents who are to pay the expense, both in price and money and in blood and property many times. So this is uh, this is exactly why. They did not want a single person to do that because, again, well, Madison was right. He said, in no part of the Constitution is more wisdom. This is the best, smartest part of the Constitution. In no part of the Constitution is more wisdom to be found than in the clause which confides the question of war or peace to the legislature and not to the executive department. This is not something that they just willy-nilly threw in there. This is something that they did with thoughtful and studied care, Madison put it elsewhere. They intentionally learned from history. They intentionally understood that if you let a single person have that power, you're going to have wars for no reason all the time. That doesn't mean legislatures wouldn't uh, basically abdicate their duty and pass that along past the buck, or maybe they were interested in stuff, but it was much more difficult. The more centralized, uh, then you have a single point of failure. One person is bad, then it screws over everybody. But if you need a few hundred, it's a little bit more difficult. Unfortunately, it's uh, the people have been really bad about this. They've been okay with supporting all kinds of people on all sides of the political spectrum. They don't understand this stuff, and maybe they're just not even on board. Anyways, I covered this. Oh, I guess I wanted to... Uh, that's all of it. I've got some FAQs then. I think I have some time here. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So we've got the power to wage, declare war, which is changing the status, peace to war. That's that's in Congress. Then waging the war once it is a status of war. That's the commander in chief. That's the executive branch. And why? They did not want a single person to do this because that person would be very likely to do it to aggrandize himself, to expand power, riches, etc., not caring about uh, anybody else. Anyway, so some very, very uh, important questions, ones that we get very often, like what qualifies it as war? Can they, you know, drop a few bombs on this person because they put their ships in the wrong place? Or can uh, you support a, a group over here or over there because, uh, you know, you've got human rights violations, whatever it may be? And can they just do very small limited attacks or 
invasions or air raids or from ships or whatever it may be, can they have some level of violence and it not be a war so the executive branch can just do that on its own? Well, a very typical dictionary definition of war at the time of the founding was this, the exercise of violence under sovereign command against such as opposed. That was from Barlow's Complete English Dictionary. I think it was 1772, 73. Again, the exercise of violence under sovereign command against such as oppose. And I covered these types of definitions in that episode I mentioned early on, the power to declare war and introduction. There are some other dictionary definitions in there as well, all very similar. So if you have uh, the commander in chief of a military in the United States exercising violence under the sovereign command of the United States, the people of the United States represented in that situation. And if the, the place where they dropped a single bomb or a bullet is opposing that, then that is an act of war. That act of war, if it is not a repelling a sudden attack, as Jerry and Madison told us, had to get a declaration of war from Congress, period. So that's one that we get often is, well, this doesn't count as war, so it doesn't need a declaration. Wrong. Any single, any single act of violence against what is opposed in another country is an act of war and requires a declaration. Now, a lot of people will also say, well, what about Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson? Well, he did it. He had this war with the Barbary pirates and he had no declaration. He just went over there and it was a limited thing. And he kind of held back, but there was a war. Now, the only way that you can actually say that the only way that you can actually make that claim rather than act, ask it as a question, hey, I heard this. But if you make that claim that Jefferson did that, you either have not studied any of the history and you're just picking up propaganda from somebody else and spreading it in support of the monster state, or you're a liar. There's no way around it. And it could be both, actually, because that view has absolutely nothing to do with what actually happened. Jefferson was even more restrained than I think he needed to be after the Pasha of Tripoli declared war on the United States, and he still said it was only he could only go beyond the line of defense. And maybe this is one of those things where he's saying, you know, without a declaration of war or a sudden attack, he could defend ships. But there wasn't a sudden attack on uh, on the United States uh, territory as well. So then he needed to go back to Congress. And he did that repeatedly. Now, I covered that in a pretty long episode it looks like over two years ago, Thomas Jefferson versus the Barbary Pirates. It's actually one of my favorite episodes because it covers that very important argument that so many people make. Well, you guys are, you know, this 10th Amendment group, you're ten, uh, Jeffersonians, and Jefferson didn't require a declaration of war. And this is an absolute lie. So I encourage you to check that one out as well. Another question we get is, well, once it starts, how does it end? And here's James Madison again in his Helvidius letters. August 24th, 1793, in his paper number one. And this is, I think, just some insight. I don't actually understand the process of ending as much as I should, but here's how Madison put it. Those who are conduct a war cannot, in the nature of things, be proper or safe judges whether a war ought to be commenced, continued, or concluded. So the commenced part is changing the status from peace to war. That's Congress continued, well, that's the funding of Congress, and concluded, that's, again, Congress maybe ratifying a peace treaty, for example, saying, yeah, we're good on this. Even if the executive branch maybe kind of initiates that, James Madison said it's never in the hands of the executive branch to make any of those decisions. And here's why. He continued, they are barred from the latter functions by a great principle in free government. Hmm. Analogous to that which separates the sword from the purse or the power of executing from the power of enacting laws. So if they can carry out the war, this is a great principle in what would set up a free government. That is not having that decision be in the hands of a single person. And the last one, just briefly, what makes up a constitutional foreign policy based on these principles? If you're going along this line and understanding why the founders did this, and I covered a little bit more of the background and the history in that other episode, The Power to Declare War and Introduction, here's how Thomas Jefferson put it, that it was the policy of his administration. This is his first inaugural address in March of 1801. He actually mentioned peace in that inaugural address. I think it was, and I did an episode on this a while back. It was 10, 11, 12 times in this one short speech 
And Jefferson was a terrible public speaker, great writer, and he keep, kept saying, peace, 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 peace. And here's the policy of his administration. Peace, commerce, and honest friendship with all nations, entangling alliances with none, zero entangling alliances. In other words, if you're following the vision of the founders, the Constitution, you are not going to put the United States into a permanent alliance with anyone because you cannot, you're not responsible for how they act. If you say, well, we're going to defend you forever, no matter what, against these people, and then they do stuff that incites a war to drag you in, it's very easy to cause a lot of problems. And I think there could be an argument to be made, and I haven't studied it enough, that, well, we know that treaties that go beyond the limit of, a, of the Constitution are void. They shouldn't even be authorized, and there are many of those. So would one that commits well we can get that into that in another episode i do have to do a little bit more study and i've got some papers on it that i want to look at in the near future anyways here's george washington with a very similar message in his farewell address september of 1796 it is our true policy to steer clear of permanent alliance with any portion of the foreign world now washington had a qualifier on that he said that we should not abdicate our responsibilities to any international agreements we already have because you have to be, act in a trustworthy manner. You have to act honest in order to get that in response. And it doesn't matter if the rest of the world is garbage. You still have to lead by example. That's a good moral person right there with that type of approach. So he said we have to continue. We have to actually fulfill our agreements. But if we have any that uh, create a permanent alliance, they should not be continued. They need to be ended. So when does that happen? Well, again, we're talking about treaties. There are many things I'm looking at, things like NATO. I have never really studied that. Should that even exist under the Constitution? My gut instinct tells me no, but I don't really know too much about it. Maybe somebody else has some info on that as well. Well, I hope you guys found this interesting. I hope it was educational. I hope you learned something more than anything. This is a very, very serious time we live in. But uh, if you're a patriot and you love the Constitution and liberty, this is the great time to be alive, to defend liberty at its moment of maximum danger. I want to take a look over at the chat and see if there's anything interesting for me to get over here. Uh, Clay Kent talks about things happening in other countries. It's, it's their business, not ours. And the idea of permanent alliance means if a new leader comes in, a new president, a new monarch, whatever, you're committed to them as well. And that's why I think uh, these types of things need to be rejected. I know Ron Paul was talking about this uh, on his show yesterday, The Liberty Report, maybe the day before, saying that the way out of the situation that we're seeing right now, and I don't want to make it too contextual time-wise because this is timeless information, no matter who the conflict is, he said that what we're dealing with now, the best way is to get out of NATO. And I think if we're talking about the foreign policy of people like Jefferson, Washington, even Madison and Adams, who probably weren't as good in practice as those two on, on this message, were saying peace first, no entangling alliances. Shane Lackey says, we the people do not have the power of the purse. Yes. And if you give up the power of the purse and the sword, Patrick Henry th said, there's no way to be free. Uh, Haji 1954 talks about Madison referring to conflicts of interest. Yes, conflicts of interest, the person that can wage war for the sake or declare war for the sake of waging it. That's when it's in one person's hand. He also mentioned that conflicts of uh, interest is the name of an excellent show by Kyle Anzalone. I, I know, I think he goes by Anzalone, but if we're going Italian, Kyle, we know it's Anzalone. But that is a good show as well. And I got to meet uh, Kyle recently. Uh, and he's a really great guy. Clay Kent says, what's wrong with being a Jeffersonian? Absolutely nothing at all. And if I put it that way, I apologize. But the point was, uh, people will claim that if you're a Jeffersonian and then you're saying that the executive has to go to Congress to get power to just launch a couple of, to get authority to launch even just a, a single missile into another country that isn't repelling a sudden attack. They're claiming that, uh, that you can't be a Jeffersonian, but what they're doing is they're lying or they're just ignorant of the history. We know that a lot of that propaganda has been out there for a long, long time. Ed Hen said, I read a book on that with the Barbary Pirates. It was shocking and fun history. Maybe not fun for the folks at the time, plus the American Navy was lacking at the time. Such scary times. And even with that, Jefferson even cut the size of the military because he did not want the country to be in a state of perpetual debt. He said, we must not let our rulers load us with perpetual debt. 
Uh, seeing if there's anything else. Woodrow Wilson, every war since his term via the Federal Reserve. Fiat, said Shane Lackey. Patricia Dance, war is all good as long as it's my guy who declares it. And of course, that's how most people in political uh, action that's how most people act about basically anything today. They don't care about principles. They just care about factions. If we're talking about Washington, we just celebrated his birthday yesterday, Washington's birthday instead of President's Day, as they want to call it. Uh, Washington told us that factions going back and forth and back and forth and flip-flopping and expanding the size and scope of government, this is a frightful despotism on its own, but it leads to a permanent despotism. Appreciate you mentioning that, Patricia, and I appreciate you guys spending some time with me today. I should take a moment to mention, of course, if you support the work that we're doing, you want us to reach and teach more people about the Constitution and liberty and how to defend them when government refuses to, which is all the time. Our membership program starts out as little as two bucks a month over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. You can also help spread the word about this show by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, smashing the like button on the mainstream video platforms, well, really everywhere, leaving comments, subscribing, getting notifications, but especially those reviews on the podcast platforms, those help out a great deal. Again, I appreciate you being here. Sorry for missing Monday, but uh, I really definitely needed some time to catch up and uh, take a little time to rest. I mean, I worked most of the day, but I caught up on some things that I needed to do behind the scenes. I hope you enjoyed this episode and I'll see you uh, next time on Friday here on the Path to Liberty.